or is it just... Now, the reason you're here is because I want you to read from Joan Crawford's autobiography. No, no we're not going to do that. <laughs> has anyone ever seen, has, has anyone seen Julie do that? Uh, well, it's the funniest you. thing in New York. When she, the next time she's, the, ne the next time she's at Birdland, you have to go see and insist that she read seriously from Joan Crawford's autobiography. It's the funniest act in town. <laughs> All right, well, I'll have to project. I'll, since I'm a theater actress, I'll have to project. Because that's not working right now. I know, it was working. I think I blew it out. That's what theater actresses do. Um, well, as the press release says, very few people, if any, have inhabited the world of showbiz and politics so dramatically, comprehensively, and successfully as David Rothenberg. And when you read this memoir, you will also be very, very moved because it's not only a journey of an organization, of an industry, of a career, it's the journey of a man whose life is so well lived. It's, it's truly a profound book. So I'd like to just welcome you, David. Uh, but can we begin at the beginning? You wanted to be a sports writer. You were a Jewish kid in New Jersey. And you had an Aunt Hilda, who was a big influence on you, and I'd love you to talk about her. Pardon me? You back. For me or for the uh, microphone? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first I want to tell you that I'm 70, I don't say anymore that I'm 79. When you tell people you're 79, they say, oh, that's so old. I'm in my 80th year, which usually provokes applause. <laughs> because, see, 80 is a milestone. When you say you're 79, oh my God, it's, that's so old. Uh, my, uh, what? You are. You are? Yes, 19, August 19, 1933. <laughs> um, my Aunt Hilda, uh, uh, between marriages, uh, I was about 11 or 12, and she discovered me. And that, I mean, she, we had a closely knit family, and of course she was around, but she suddenly decided I was kind of special, and she took me out on school nights. Now, I was in the sixth or seventh grade. She took me to, mo we had movie dates. And I've uh, always said everyone needs an Auntie Mame in their lives. And my Aunt Hilda used to say to me, we'd go to the movies, and then we would go out afterwards for deli. <laughs> and she would say, and she would always say to me you're a very special person and it, it really it really wasn't until i was uh, embedded in the fortune society when i appreciated when i met so many men and women who had no adult figure in their life that gave them that and i realized how lucky i was that at a very early age somebody made me feel that I could do anything that I intended to, anything that I wanted to do, I could do. And that's, and that's the role she played in my life. I don't think she ever knew that. She's you know, long since gone. But uh, in those years, she made me feel I could conquer the world. Well, that's and I may start crying. Very, well, that's a wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful part of the book. Now, you loved sports. Yeah. You loved baseball. I, I loved all sports. I wanted to be a sports writer because I thought I, I could see games and get free and get paid for it. Can you tell, um, there's a wonderful, although rather poignant um, piece in the book about the first fan club that you started. And I'd love you to tell that story. Uh, I, I was about 12 or 13 and I was a New York Giants fan. And there was a, in the sporting news, that, that's a newspaper for baseball fans. There was an ad called for something called the Trading Post. That there was a uh, a publication just for fans, and I I got a copy of it. And I read that there were different teams had fan clubs. This is 1940 six or seven, right after World War II, but there was no giant fan club. And so I decided I want to start one, and I ran an ad in the Trading Post, and I said for two dollars a year, you can get a subscription to the Giant Fan Club newspaper. And my father had a mimeograph machine. You, this house all knows what a mimeograph machine is. I was gonna is. say. There's somebody <laughs> young enough that or somebody tried to deny. Because last night I was in Maplewood, New Jersey and there was a 15 year old kid in the audience and I said a mimeograph machine is something, I mean, he, he got it. I had to explain to him what a typewriter was too. Um, 
and my father had a mimeograph machine and I would make up, I made up a sports quiz about giant players and I went to the ballpark and I interviewed a pitcher named Monty Kennedy and I ran an ad in the sporting news and I had about 32 people or 35 people who subscribed to it. I, here I was in junior high school and doing it from the basement of my family's house in Teaneck, New Jersey. And one day, a long distance call came from New York to New just Jersey. Just like in the movies, just like in the movies. In those days, a call from New York to New Jersey was long distance, and it was Steve Ellis calling for the New York Giants, wanting to meet with David Rothenberg, because they were very impressed about this, the the um, fan club that was started. They're walking out on us. <laughs> and uh, my father drove me into the city and I went upstairs to meet Steve Ellis. Anybody remember him? He was a sportscaster for the Giants. And I guess they expected an adult to walk in. I was about five foot tall and my voice hadn't changed yet. <laughs> and uh, they said, you're it? And I said, yes. <laughs> And they didn't think you were special like Ann Hilda did. <laughs> <laughs> they were they, horrified. They told me that they were so impressed that the Giants wanted to incorporate this and none of the program Giant Jottings they would announce it and that I could continue being a writer for it and they would bring me to spring training to Sarasota with the Giants. Well, <laughs> that was... No, it's a scene out of a movie. Right. I, I wasn't squirting yet in those days, but I started. <laughs> I'll explain that afterwards to you. <laughs> it's a family audience. So I, um, I went back to New Jersey and I did write an article for their first published paper and they announced on the year that they had 20,000 subscribers and they would never take my calls after that. And my Isn't that And my father was so upset and we didn't want anything that we didn't want, you know, we didn't want to get paid. We, we just, I wanted to go to Sarasota and continue writing with them. And that's, and I always said that was when, the first time I found out what the real world was like. And I couldn't believe that the Giants did that to me. Yeah. No, that, that made me turn off to the Giants, I have to tell you, after I read that story. But now, as you were growing up, and you talk about this in the book, that you were always attracted to, you know, glamorous women and snappy one-liners. And uh, All you about were Eve. Exactly. You were attracted to the theater. And you had to figure out, after you got out of the Army, how do I get into this business? And can you tell us a little bit about how you did get into this business of show business and PR and Max Eisen? The business of which there is no sh business like. That's right. From the song of the same name. Correct. So tell us a little bit about Max Eisen and, I, and how you got into this business. Well, I saw, when, I, when, I was, when I was in high school, I saw the movie All About Eve, and I just wanted to be in their world. You missed everything that was interesting. <laughs> C come in, we'll humiliate you for coming in late. You missed everything that was interesting. <laughs> and if there's a quiz afterwards, you're going to miss all the important questions. All right. Um, so where was I? Max oh, I, eyes. I, I, no, I saw it all about even. I just wanted to be in the world where everybody seemed so sophisticated and bright and funny. And so when I got out of the army and I came to New York and I got an assortment of jobs, typing with mimeograph and stencils and whatnot, but I answered every ad in the Times. Remember the Times classified ads? Of course. On Sunday, there was this thick. Uh, that was before uh, uh, Craig's Choice or whatever that is. <laughs> Craig's List. <laughs> it was Sophie's Choice. No, it was Craig's List. Um, it was. Uh, <laughs> I answered every ad in the Times that said show business or theater. And uh, after being in New York about 10 months working on various jobs, I got a call from a man named Max Eisen saying to come in the following morning for an interview. Now, that would have been a Sunday that he, he, I got the call on a Saturday night to come in on a Sunday. That should have been my first clue. Um, and it was in the Sardis building, so I figured that was serious business. And I arrived there and he said he wanted to hire five kids for the summer and, and uh, he interviewed me. You knew Max, didn't you? Piece of work. I did not um, know Max Eisen. No. And uh, you knew him, there. And um, 
he didn't call and I kept calling and calling and calling and finally Bob Larkin who was working for him said listen he hired the five guys he wanted for the summer theaters already but you're so persistent and I need help here stuffing envelopes come in and I'll try and talk Max into hiring you so I went down there and they went, needed someone to answer the phones and stuff envelopes and I was in show business $60, $60 a week six days a week and every other Sunday and one of the things I remember, it may have been Ann Hilda, but somebody told me that if you get into the field that you want, make yourself indispensable. And what I did is within weeks, I knew everyone in that had to call on the phone, and I was taking actors to the B. Calmus show at midnight, Charles Nelson Riley and uh, Jenny Lou Law and people like that, and then being in the office the next day. And at the end of this, this was a job for the summer. And at the end of the summer, they couldn't fire me or let me go because I knew where everything was. I knew how the office was running. And you could probably handle Charles Nelson Riley as well, <laughs> who was you, not so easy. You're late, but that's all right. We'll, we'll embarrass you. He's harassing everyone. Just sit down and make yourself comfortable. No, I've, I've harassed Tony before. Uh, so I made myself indispensable and I worked for Max for about oh, eight or ten months and I met a press agent named Bob Ullman who was fascinated by the fact that I was working, uh, I used to say I worked a half a day for Max from 10 in the morning till 10 at night <laughs> and, and he wouldn't let you go out for lunch but Bob Ullman said to me I have a show that's opening and if it's a hit I'm going to need help and the, the show was Little Mary Sunshine, I called him the next day and he offered me a job five dollars five days a week at $85, $85 and I was, I was in. Were you thrilled? Well, I was thrilled because Bob did not whip me and did not chain me to the chair and he also taught me so much about the theater because he was in love with the theater and he, um, he also arranged, in, in those days th there, were no, there was no air conditioning so the shows, many shows closed in the summer yes. and, and a lot of people went into summer stock and Bob got me a job first at Skowhegan, Maine in the uh, Lakewood Summer Theater and then the following summer uh, Bucks County Playhouse and that eventually changed changed my whole theater life. People in the theater, uh, well, we all love David for many, many reasons, but... Name you one. Are, you Name one. <laughs> for many reasons. But you are famously known uh, in the business as the man who escorted Elizabeth Taylor to the opening of Hamlet. Can you... Now, I don't really see any youngsters in the audience, but can you describe to people how amazing it is because I think some people don't realize what a media circus well first I like to think to say that it was Elizabeth Taylor who had me at the uh, opening at the that, opening that, of yes, the, yes. Um, it was all right it's 1962 we're in Rome Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor are making a movie he had replaced Stephen Boyd the movie is Cleopatra at that time he was married to Sybil Burton is Sybil in the house <laughs> No. And Richard and Elizabeth inexplicably was married to Eddie Fisher. <laughs> but but rumors were flying that uh, there was a, an affair going on. And uh, there was no e-channel, but the Daily News and the Post really recorded this rather uh, voluminously. And everyone knew. It was like Angelina and Brad, only with talent. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it really was a worldwide phenomenon. Sir, well, then they went to Puerto Vallarta, where he was making Night of the Iguana, and we saw all the paparazzi there. And at that time, Al I was working for Alex Cohn, the Broadway producer, and he said to me, we're going to be doing Hamlet. Richard Burton starring, John Gielgud's directing, and you handle the press. <laughs> and the press was Bedlam. And so when I... Um, they decided we were going to rehearse in Toronto because they thought it would be less obtrusive with the press, with the mm -hmm. paparazzi. I arrived in Toronto and uh, the, um, the King Edward Hotel was being picketed by the uh, a Legion of Decency because Richard and Elizabeth were living together in sin. They were not married. This is 63. You did not live with a woman. A man did not live with a woman with whom he was not wed. And, and not only that, I mean, I think the, the, the Vatican, which, you know, of course, uh, any Catholic was very, very uh, obsessed. Of which you are one. Of oh. which I, I was one. I'm, I'm a lapsed Catholic now, desperate to be a Jew, but that's another <laughs> story. Um, yes. Um, but the Vatican, in, in fact, I, I think, issued an edict d d claiming that, yes, you know... Yes, they said that, not that, nice. Yes, that, that she was a sinner and, a, you know, basically. So, so 
<laughs> All right, so we're, uh, so I, uh, I arrive, uh, Alex says we're gonna have lunch, but they had to clear the dining room, and I go into this empty dining room, and there is Richard Burton, Elizabeth Taylor, Sir John Gielgud, Alex Cohn, and me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a business lunch. <laughs> and um, Richard said, so what's with the press? And I said, well, Richard, uh, uh, I told Life Magazine, Tom Perdue at Life, that uh, next April when we open in New York, it's uh, Billy Shakespeare's 400th birthday, and the appropriate cover would be Richard Burton as Hamlet, and they agreed to come to Toronto and photograph you for the Life cover. And that was a big deal in those days. It was, it was like, like getting on the O'Reilly show is now. Absolutely. And, and so uh, Richard said, that's great. What else? And I said, well, here's a list of about 50 people that want to interview you. You know, we can decide. I can work with John Springer, your publicist. And they said, fine, fine, fine. What's, and, and Richard turned to John Gielgud, as he was wont to do, and said, uh, what about the production, the cast, and whatnot? At which point, Elizabeth turned to me and said, oh, they don't need us for this, honey. Let's go sit over there. I said, all right, if you have, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. Somebody so has I'm, to sit with Elizabeth. So I'm Taylor. sitting with Elizabeth, and I couldn't help but notice that she was very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> really uh, breathtaking. And the thing that was so fascinating was here I am with the, not only the most glamorous woman in Hollywood, but also now the most celebrated because of this international scandal. And she wanted to know all about me. She was not playing the star. She was very other oriented. H how did you get this job? You look so young. What do you, you know, I was 28 and I looked 12. And she wanted to know all about me. And she said, um, you know, this is all very new for Richard. Richard has always been able to go out to the bar, bars and bar hop after a show. She said, I grew up with the paparazzi. I've never been able to go out and make new friends. And she said, my friends are where I work. David. And so she said, are you going to be around during the rehearsals? And I said, yeah. And so we hung out together. It's a wonderful it, story. And I think what, what and it really is. she asked me to be her date at the opening. Yes. Said, oh, okay. Leave oh, okay. I think what it really also illustrates is that that is what a true star is, which is someone who actually is actually interested in other people. Yes, yeah. You know, the, the, uh, the true stars that I know are actually very, very kind and very interested in well, other people, like Bernadette Peters well, is and one I, of them. And I found out with Betty Davis. Everybody warned me about Betty Davis. Betty Davis is a screen actress. Uh, she's no longer with us in this planet. Uh, now you're all old enough. But when I worked on Night of the Iguana, every you know, some guy said, "Oh, she gets a hold of a kid like you, she'll chew you up and spit you out like bad meat." And uh, <laughs> I found a, a professional woman who wanted the people around her to do a professional job. And if you did, she was fine because she, all the pressure was on her. Of course. And we had a nice time. I found that with almost everyone, with, with the notable exception of one actress. We'll get, we'll get to we'll her get later. We'll get to her. We'll leave but let's I, talk a little bit pause, about the let's 60s. Let's pause for a commercial. We'll come exactly. back to who... Let's talk a little bit about the 60s, because the 60s was a very, very interesting time, yes. obviously. And uh, a time that obviously was part of a, a social revolution. 1963, 64, 65, 66, what I always found interesting about the 60s is that each year is exponentially different from the next, which is not really true of every decade. But we now have the anti-war movement, and you are seeing a lot of theater. You're now interested in producing theater. You're, you, you're, you're seeing shows like Viet Rock, Megan Terry's well, but, Viet but Rock. But before that, there was the Civil Rights Movement. And the Civil I, well, Rights and Movement, I that's right. I had been very involved in sit-ins in the 50s when I was in college, before the modern Civil Rights Movement. And so uh, th that led to, and, and I was active in the anti-war movement, but the Civil Rights Movement was always at the, the the core of my political passion, or social passion. But what, what I found so interesting in, in the book, because you really have been a person who has been able to meld art and politics and social action together. Not many people can do that. Would you tell that to the New York Times? I will tell that to the New York Times. Which is, because a lot of times political theater is sort of agiprop theater and yeah. it's not maybe as emotionally uh, resonant, but 
Can you tell us a little bit about the play that, in fact, really did change your life? Well, it was Fortune of Men's Eyes. Um, I had, uh, when I was in Canada doing plays, I became friendly with a uh, the drama critic, Nathan Cohn, who never liked anything. And he said to me one day, I read a play by a Canadian that will never get done in Canada. But uh, and, he, and I said, Nathan, you haven't liked anything since Potemkin. If you liked it, I, <laughs> I'd be happy to read it. And he sent me a script of um, Fortune in Men's Eyes, which I read, and I read it, and then I reread it. And it's a. Pl I had seen prison movies, and prison movies they were either escaping or rioting, um, yelling yeah, yeah, you know what. But this was a play about a kid who gets raped his first night in prison, and I. That was a story that I didn't know. This was news to me, and it was also a good play. And so I contact. I wrote to John Herbert, and I said I felt I was locked in a room with four cobras, and I went to meet him, and I said I want to see, try and get this play on. Try, and I gave it to several producers, and they all said it's a great play, but who would come to see this? And of course, when I met John Herbert, I learned that this was his story. He was the 16-year-old who was gang raped on his first night in prison. And I said, John, this is a world that's unknown to the to people that like me. And so I became committed to doing the play as theater in, of the 60s, the kind of social uh, reflection of, of a uh, terrible condition that, that obviously existed and unknown to the public. The play got on, and while we were in rehearsal, the actors insisted on going to a jail so they could authenticate. Sorry, sorry. It's probably my mother. <laughs> So we, uh, we arranged to go to Rikers Island, which is a city jail. Uh, and my first visit, my first of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of visits to jails and prisons around the world. And, on, and I've never changed my mind. My first visit to Rikers Island, we saw these young kids being herded around, and I said, this is an exercise in futility. That whatever they're there for, whatever they did, uh, whatever demons they have, whatever laws or morality or whatever they broke, how could they be better from this? That was just an instinct that I had, and I've never changed my mind about that. Anyway, we had to get the play on. And uh, a few weeks after the play opened, by the way, wildly diverse reviews. Uh, Nathan, um, Norman Nadel, remember him? He'll be on Famous Fleeting. He was a drama critic. At the, he said, unless you're obsessed by sodomy, there's no reason to see this play. Um, whereas uh, Michael Smith in The Village Voice said, that uh, anyone angered about this play should direct their anger at the reality it mirrors. And uh, about four weeks after the play opened, a college professor called me and said, I'm bringing 20 students to the theater to see the play. Can we have a dialogue afterwards? And so we, I, that was right up my alley, yeah. using the theater as a place for of social course. discourse. And we invited the entire audience to stay for the uh, discussion. And uh, people, Vic Arnold, one of the actors who was very intense about the play, and uh, David Hannigan, who was a stage manager, who came out to us telling us he had done three years in a juvenile facility in Iowa. They wanted to be on the panel with me. And I was perfect on the pa panel because I asked all the naive questions someone from Teaneck, New Jersey would ask about prisons. And the audience was very complimentary to the man in the one man in the audience said, ah, this place a lot of crap. I don't buy any of it. And from the back of the house, a voice said, well, if my 20 years counts for anything, you people couldn't watch what happens to us. And I said, would you come on the stage? And Pat McGarry came down and talked about, this is 67. So Pat had been in, he had done over 20 years on the Stolman plan, and he had been in the Florida chain gang, and he had been in San Quentin, and he had been in Rikers Island and Danamora. <clears throat> and he had the audience spellbound for an hour, and I said, boy, talk about good theater and good politics and good social reflection. And afterwards, we went for coffee and we stayed up till about three in the morning. I said, Pat, come back next week. People have to hear this. And he said, I did white time. You have to get somebody that did black time. We're segregated in the prisons and it's a different experience. Was that some news to you? Uh, yes. Never yes. occurred to me that New York prisons would be, I mean, prison's prison. Um, he, I said, I don't know anyone. You're the first guy I've met. Mm -hmm. And he said, I know a guy. He said, I work in a, um, in a, um, tailor shop. He said, I have a customer, I'm sure did time. And he came back the following week with a man named Clarence Cooper, African American who had been in uh, Milan, Michigan, a, a, a federal reformatory. And what made it so exciting is Pat was outrageous and flamboyant and Clarence was uh, 
intense and very bright, but very careful in his selection of words. They were, it was central casting. The two of them were perfect. And it was fascinating. And the New York Times came a few weeks later and did it, because we, we started doing this every Tuesday night, and the Times ran a story and the headline said, the drama continues after the curtain falls. And that every Tuesday night, the audience was suddenly filled with men, and later women, but at the beginning only men, who had done, done time. time. And one of the things that came out in my discussions with these guys afterwards is that most of them were able to stay at, were able to break the crime prison crime cycle because they were in AA. And they had a foundation, they had a support system that dealt with some of their demons. And that, um, but they hadn't dealt with the rage of the prison experience. Right. And so I started getting calls, this was the 60s, when yes. you didn't have to apologize about caring. Right. And, and, um, I started getting calls from teachers and ministers saying, could you come to uh, and, and bring some of those guys we met at the theater? And so I was on the si circuit with me and, and a lot of the guys started hanging out at my theater office. And it was a Is that how the Fortune Society uh, evolved? After, after a, a, several weeks of this, I said, we have the nucleus of an organization. We could educate the public and change the prison system. How naive. And we called ourselves Fortune Society from the play's title, Fortune in Men's Eyes. And my theater office for the first three years was the Fortune Society office. And we, we what was going through your mind at this time, David? Were you, because you were living in, in, in a number of different worlds, yeah. in a sense. I never thought I was going to leave the theater. I thought the Fortune Society was my Kiwanis Club. Yes. I, would, I sort of got that, that you, it, it was sort of, it was pulling you in as if it were sort of a tide. But, but you really were, you know, still Mr. David Rothenberg, the producer and in, in the theater. Was there something that that you decided, I really have to devote well, more time here? A couple here. of things happened. I, because I was a good publicist, I called David Suskind and his office and suggested a program of four formerly incarcerated people to be on his program. Uh, in, in the 60s, people who had been in prison did not go on television. Their career, their jobs, their housing, everything, their neighbors, they just were not a visible presence. There was no advocacy in the 60s. And so I got four of the guys who agreed to go on Suskind. Now my office was on the sixth floor of a building on 1545 Broadway, 46. Mm -hmm. It's now where that very attractive Marriott Ma Ma yes. Ma the <laughs> ugly building right. is there. But this was a six-story building behind the Victoria, you had to go behind the box office of the so these four guys go on television and it was a powerful two hours and they poured it out and it was news for America. And at the end of the program, Suskind said, these men are part of a new organization, Fortune Society, 1545 Broadway, contact David Rothenberg. And the next day, we thought we were going to get lots of calls, people asking us to come and speak. And what did you get? The next day, the sixth floor, the, from the sixth floor down, when I arrived, the whole stairwell was filled. It looked like a prison riot. The, about 250 guys, and I'm sitting there with my hair poster. I was the press agent for hair at the time. <laughs> I'm sitting there, and these guys, exactly what guys coming out of prison today are asking for. They were asking for jobs. They were looking for a place to stay. They were looking for a place where they could not do what they were doing, but they didn't know how to do it. And I'm saying, I don't know, you know, I didn't know what. And a tall white guy with a toothpick in his mouth, am I allowed to swear at Strand? Uh, this tall white guy with a toothpick in his mouth comes over to me and says, you don't know what the fuck you're doing, do you? And I said, I don't have a clue. And he said, move over. His name was Kenny Jackson. He said, listen, I'm in a fellowship that, for drinkers. We talk to each other. If we just keep talking, and he started, he became the first counselor at Fortune sitting there, and he started telling the guys, look, if we just hang together, maybe we can beat this thing. And a few hours later, a guy named Mel Rivers out of bed looking like 10 miles of pimp walked in, and I thought, well, you know, what does he want? And, he's, and he said, I'm just checking you guys out. And he and Kenny hit it off right away, and the three of us, started really hanging together and we decided this is what we wanted to do with our lives. It's an incredible scene in the book. It's, uh, and, and, and there's more, I mean, these well, there's are... there's the phone call I got. Yes. Do you want that story? Yes, I do. The phone call I got is, I, uh, I got a call from a woman, her husband's uh, up for parole, she's on welfare, she's disabled, her, the welfare check didn't come, she has two kids, can fortune help? 
the other phone rings and it's an agent saying, I have four people coming in from Hollywood, some star, I need four tickets for here Saturday night, can you get me the tickets? So I said to the lady with the husband in prison and the welfare check and the children, can I get your number, I'll call you back, I have an emergency on the other phone. And I put the phone down and I got the tickets for the agent for here. And then I looked at the other phone and said, what did you do? What was the emergency? The emergency was the tickets for hair. And I called the woman back and, and got, did whatever had to be done. But I just looked at the phones and said, David, you get your priorities straight. You know, it was just, it was, it, everything was leading up to that. It didn't, you know, that was the moment that I said, this is. There were a number of epiphanies, but that certainly was one and of them. And Attica didn't, didn't lessen it either. Well, I was going to ask about Attica because, you know, you've been such a witness to history, David, and in 1971, of course, the 60s are now over, but of course there's a lot of residue, but the Attica uprising, and, you know, that was, I think, a, a moment also in the book. I found it very, very upsetting. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, because you were there, is after Attica, after the uprising, you were very, very resolved in your fighting the prison system even more. But what has kept you, because you have seen so much, you have dealt with so much, you've, you've uh, dealt with people who, whose lives really are very, very broken. What kept you after Attica from really going down a rabbit hole of despair and not giving up? What, what made you keep going? The next, the next person that comes in the door. There's always somebody new that comes in who says, I want, so, I want something else. They don't, a lot of guys don't articulate it that way, but what they're saying is, there must be something else for me. In the play The Castle, Kaz Torres says, I uh, always knew there was something else, I just didn't know where to find it. Mm -hmm. Now, the book travels, it's not chronological, it goes back and forth in Keep different ways. Keep guessing, I see. <laughs> Yes, but... We do find out um, that you were, in, in many ways, in a prison of, of your own I was making. living a duplicitous you life. You were living a duplicitous life. You were a, a closeted gay man, and, and, and you were very tortured about it. And it was in the 70s that things started opening up for you. Can you tell us a little bit about, about well, I, that? Well, I made a decision, and Fortune was a big factor in it. Fortune was about six or seven years old, and the gay movement, had, Stonewall had been happening, and I was watching... From a, from a distance. From the sidelines. And I suddenly realized I had been in the civil rights movement, I was very active in the prisoners' rights movement, and here was a movement that dealt with my self-imposed uh, oppression, and I wasn't a part of it. And I, I made some decisions that I was going to do something about it. And I was... I talked to the David Susskind show, was mm -hmm. going to have six people who were living duplicitous lives. Um, and so I called the people from Fortune together, the key cadre, six, seven men, five men, two women, who had all been in prison, and I said, I have three things to tell you. One is, I'm gay. Two, I'm going on television and talk about it. And three, I will be prepared to submit my resignation as director of the Fortune Society. Long pause. Kenny Jackson says, what are you going to wear on TV? <laughs> Not the question I was expecting. I said, what kind of a question is that? And he said, well, look how you dress. You're a slob. <laughs> dress nicely and make us proud of you. And then Melvin Rivers said what I have told him. He doesn't even remember saying this. I said the most sophisticated political comment I've ever heard. He said, why would you resign? And I said, because it might hurt the organization. He said, look, you stood by us for six years telling us to be honest. Give us the opportunity to stand by you. That was, yeah. that was tough. And, and, and so everybody stood around and Kenny said, can, can we get back to work now? Uh -huh. And I went on. Such a great <laughs> scene in the book. Obviously, I'm tearing up. Well, it's it, it, such a great moment I, in the book. I tear up because that was unconditional love. That was people who said, um, we're not judging you. You didn't judge us, and we're not judging you. And uh, let's go. And so Kenny said, can we get back to work? It was, it's a great scene, and, and you'll love it. And what I found so interesting is that Clay Felker, who was, of course, running New York Magazine at that point, he killed the story. He didn't have the guts. Yeah. 
he didn't have the guts of Kenny Jackson or Mel, Mel or, or Fran or any of the people that what were at Fortune. What do you think you do the movie version in, this, in that scene? I really don't know. Well, I'll have to think about it. But it's a great, great scene in the book, and I, I, I urge you, again, to, to read the book. Um, but you also talk about once you went public with being openly gay, it just was such a great advantage. Well, what, what happened was, of course, when AIDS surfaced, and, and the New York, well, the, the world was not dealing with AIDS. Um, no, it was a clarion call. Yeah, and, and I became a very, uh, well, I got a call from from a doctor saying there is a, we want you to come to a meeting at six o'clock at this clinic on a Thursday morning because, and they told me that 18 people have been diagnosed with this thing and that they're all gay and that they think it's gonna be political as much as medical and that they wanted people who were political activists. And so we went and they were calling it GRID and Ginny Apuzo said, you don't, gay-related gay, gay related immune deficiency. Uh -huh. uh, and, and by the way, we also discovered that there were a lot of people that weren't gay that, would, that had AIDS in the early days, but most of them were addicts. And because they had no constituency and, and they ended up in Potter's Field, mm -hmm. they were, they were an, an, a second expendable population. But Ginny said, you don't name a disease after any group of people. And that's how GRID went to, she went to, the, to a conference with the CDC in Atlanta and they changed it to AIDS. Mm -hmm. But the, if the disease was four years old. The mayor of the city of New York was doing nothing about it because he didn't want to be perceived as supportive of gays. And that was Mayor Ed Koch? Mayor Ed Koch who had his own, <laughs> had his own closeted, uh, which we deal with later in the book. Um, uh, President Ronald Reagan wasn't dealing with it and the New York Times wasn't dealing with it. That's right. So a group of us, uh, and the prison system wasn't dealing with it because I was getting mail from inmates saying there's this thing going on here and we don't know what it is. And I'll tell you, this is really good. It shows you what Department of Correction is like. I called Marty Horn, who was then Deputy Commissioner of Correction, and said, you're gonna have a problem. Guys are being identified with AIDS and, they don't, and the inmates don't know what's happening. And he said, is there any literature? And I said, well, the only game in town is the gay, gay men's health crisis and I'll go to them and get some literature. And I did, and I sent it to Albany, and Albany sent it to the prisons, and Marty called me and said, the wardens won't let anything in with the word gay in it. And I said, Jesus, you know, talk about stupid. So I went back to the GMHC and I said, can you print up some literature with just your initials? And, not, and so we got it into the prison. And that's how it was distributed? Under GMHC. That's right. Um, but we also had a historic meeting with the New York Times who wouldn't write about it because of their institutional homophobia. And we said, um, we met with Sidney Grusin, who was the deputy publisher, four of us wrote a letter and met with him and said, people are dying and this is the most serious health uh, issue in the second half of the uh, 20th century. Three legionnaires died and it was front page around the country and hundreds and hundreds of people are dying and you're not covering it. And, and ignorance, and, you know, silence is, is death, is what uh, ACT UP used as their motto. And so we met with Sidney Grusin, and he arranged with us to, for us to meet with Abe Rosenthal, who was the managing editor at the time, and we thought it was gonna be a battle. But we walked in and Abe Rosenthal said, we need help, what can you do? And we outlined stories that had to be done for, the, uh, for, for this health issue. And let me ask you this. Um, because I, I think a lot of people in, in the city know, knew about Ed Koch, but uh, you... Not specifically. But I was going to say, this is another thing in the book that you may find very, very interesting, is that it's actually a little dishy, I have to say. I was quite, I was quite pleased dishy. that it, was, it got as gossipy and dishy as it did. And there were great, great scenes, and of course, name calling. You, you do actually call, you, you tell us the names of the people that he was involved with. So I thought that was... Uh, do you you want to hear that story? Yes, you should hear that story because it is quite fun is, and dishy. Is there, is there anything more uh, that seems less attractive than Ed Koch's sex life, I can tell you. Um, I was very close to, when Ed Koch was in Congress, he was a very progressive congressman and very supportive of the Fortune Society. He and John Conyers were our point men in Congress about federal prisoners. So when he decided to run for mayor in 77, he started having these Sunday night uh, suppers at his 
uh, house and mm -hmm. all the bright young people who were supporting it would gather there and uh, I would meet all the people who became later became prominent in the Koch administration. One of them was a uh, uh, the Deputy Commissioner of Health, a young man named Richard Nathan, who I had seen at all the political meetings around town. And Richard and I became friendly. And one night at Ed's, the, uh, the congressman's house, um, everybody was sort of gathering in the living room and Richard and I were piling the dishes up in the kitchen. It was our turn to, to be the servants. And I said, Richard, it looks like everyone's leaving. I'm splitting. He said, I'll walk you home. So as we're about to leave, Ed Koch comes over to the two of us who are standing there, the only two standing there, and he says to Richard, oh, Richard, stay. And I'm thinking, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> <laughs> and Richard said, oh, no, Ed, I'll call you later. I have to go home. So I'm walking across Washington Square Park, right around here, with Richard Nathan, and I said, what is What's th that all about? What was that all about? And he said, I'm seeing the congressman. And I said, what do you mean seeing? The he said, we're having a relationship. And I said, Jesus, the man's running for mayor. This is 1976. Ed was running for 77. 1976, it was a different ballpark. Yes, it was. He's a congressman. He's running for mayor, and he's having a homosexual relationship. I said, he's crazy. So I became Richard's confidant about what was going on. I said, first You became his beard. Uh, no, I, no I, said, <laughs> I, I said, Richard, first of all, how could you touch him? <laughs> I mean, not the prettiest face. And uh, I, I take that back. That's, it's, it's beauty is... Uh, in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, eye in the beholder, and ugliness is only skin deep. Um, so uh, as the campaign got along, you remember, those of you who were around in 77, anybody here admit, admitting to be around in 77? Ed Koch was connected by the, at the pinky with... Best Meyerson. Yeah. That was all over the place. And Richard said to me um, at the inaugural, we were all invited to the inaugural, and then to a private party, the inner circle private party, um, at, at the home of Arthur Schwartz, who was the food editor at the, t at the news. And Ed comes in with Bess Meyerson and everyone's, and Richard says to me, the gauntlet has been dropped. I, it's been made clear to me, I'm out of here. Ah. And he moved to California where he became a very successful health consultant. Now the story gets even deeper. Mm -hmm. um, you may remember Larry Kramer wrote a play called The Normal Heart, which was about a closeted gay mayor who would not respond to the AIDS which crisis. Which just won a Tony yeah, Award. And it's revival. Yeah, but this is what it was done originally. Everybody knew that he was writing about, about um, Ed Koch. All right, the calendar pages. I was on Ed's transition team for correction. He appointed me to the Human Rights Commission. I was having dinner at Gracie Mansion. We were very close, but he was moving to the right and further right, and I was getting very disenchanted. By the time he ran for his second term, I was not in his corner. Right. I was supporting anybody but Ed because, because of his politics. He moved, he became a Murdochite. So, uh, Ed, Ed is elected three times, and he's going for his fourth re-election, and he's running against the the Manhattan Borough President named David Dinkins. Mm -hmm. There's a health conference in California on AIDS, and Larry Kramer's attending, and he runs into this guy who's a health consultant named Richard Mathan. And so they have lunch, and they play Jewish geography. You know, where do, who do you know? Where do you come from? And they both discussed that they knew me. Larry knew me, and Richard knew me. And for some reason, Richard Nathan tells Larry Kramer that he is the much rumored secret lover of Ed Koch. Now that's like telling Walter Winchell. Larry Kramer is not, <laughs> loathes Ed Koch, <laughs> loathes Ed Koch because of his Quite silence. Quite a under. lot of fuel there. <laughs> Larry Kramer comes back to New York. I'm working back in the theater by then. I've left Fortune after 18 years. And I come to my office one day and there's Jack Newfield and Wayne Barrett and somebody from Newsday and somebody from New York Magazine. They all had gotten calls from Larry Kramer. Now Ed's in a primary with David Dinkins. They got calls from Larry Kramer that, uh, th that naming Ed's much noted secret lover and that the person who, can, uh, who was witness to it is me. So I'm saying, Jack, I don't, you know, Jack Newfield's an old friend. I don't know what 
and then I go into my office, I call California, I say, Richard, you're Judith, you want to be Judith Exner? <laughs> um, remember Judy? Yes. Judith Exner was the Kennedy. Um, so he said, oh my God, I didn't think, Larry, has, Larry said that Richard wanted this to come out, but it, Richard always said no. Anyway, um, what, what's, what's interesting about this is that uh, Rudy Giuliani was then was planning to run for mayor as a Republican and thought he was gonna be running against Ed Koch. And he was the uh, prosecutor of the Southern District. Mm -hmm. he, I get a call from Richard Nathan. He has been subpoenaed by Rudy Giuliani because he had gotten a grant from uh, New York City for a consultant fee and Giuliani was gonna use this against Koch. Not that he was gay, but that his former gay lover <laughs> got a grant from a, a consultant fee. But, it's uh, a dirty business. Uh, but, oh, you think? And yeah. then, um, but then uh, Dinkins upset Koch, right. and so it never came out. I stonewalled for about 30 years because I never believed that it was mine or anyone else's job to out anyone, that it was a personal thing. Mm -hmm. And I never, I, I, um, I that, understood that more people coming out was made, created political strength and power. Mm -hmm. and, but then there, uh, there was a movie being made called Outrage about all these right-wing people who were anti-gay but were closeted gays. Larry, remember Larry Craig, mm -hmm. the Idaho senator who was tapping his foot in the men's room? You were very very reluctantly part of that. Yeah, well, uh, but there were all these men. The, the guy who wrote the, uh, Larry, what was his name, Mailman, who was the Republican, chairman of the Republican Party, wrote uh, Bush's anti-gay, you know, the marriage thing. Uh-huh. I mean, all these terrible people. Roy Cohn, I mean, these hypocritical... And is that what made you... No, what, what? made... Uh, I got a call from the movie Outrage saying, Larry Kramer said, you could tell us all about Ed Koch in the movie. And I said, no, no, I've stonewall for 30 years and I loathe Ed Koch, but I'm not, I don't loathe Ed Koch. I was greatly disappointed in Ed Koch politically. Uh, you know, he's, uh, I, I guess he's all right. He has to live with himself. Um, I said, I, I, I don't want to out someone. And then the next day in the Daily News, there was an op-ed piece by Ed Koch saying that Johns, when prostitutes are arrested, the Johns should be also. Well, I've always been an advocate, first of all, that pr prostitutes shouldn't go to jail, that they should get a support system and there should be women's programs for them. And Ed boasted that when he was mayor, he outed nine Johns and ruined some lives by doing it. And I thought, that hypocrite, that he's willing to expose other people people's sexual pecca peccadilloes and he's living this duplicitous life so when they called back I said I will I'll appear in the movie and they said we'll fly to California and nah, I'm not coming to California and they said we'll send a crew and I thought a camera like this would come uh, my apartment I thought they were making Ben-Hur <laughs> <laughs> they had, they had the whole building had cameras and sound, and I and in the movie, you uh, yes, I out Ed Koch, yes. um, and nobody cared. And as Ed was interviewed, and he said, "Nobody cares about my sex life," which is true. I mean, it's not a try to picture it, you know. But it, but it is fascinating, and it's a fascinating part of the book because it also was a fascinating time in our history in yes. New York, and what was going on at the time, and and the AIDS crisis which you know is still uh, with us well, I mean, we, so um, and it's a, and, and and the fact that you are like Zelig David Rothenberg you're, <laughs> you 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 are everywhere David Rothenberg actually I, I, as I read you the miss book Nicaragua. yes I really I, I realize that you are actually part of uh, you were you were everything and everywhere but you did bring up at one point that after 18 years with the Fortune Society, at the age of 52, you decide you're going to put out your own shingle. Oh, I ran for city council. Yes, but also you were back in the theater world. Not, no, after I, after I, I was... I, was it... No, I it ran, was after that. No, I took a leave of absence from Fortune and ran for the city, city council. city council in 1985. Yes, and uh, the, the reason I ran was because AIDS had to get on the political... Right. AIDS was not an issue, and, and a group of people met, and they said they needed, they wanted somebody who could run that could make AIDS an issue but was not a single-issue candidate. And, right. And, 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 and my background in criminal justice was clear that I wasn't, and I, was, and I w lived in an area where we had an incumbent who was not evil incarnate, but not 
particularly exciting. It's an exhausting campaign. I mean, just uh, reading that, oh. what you go through, oh. just, to, just to be on city council. I mean, forget what we just went through with the election. But in 1986, you I, go back to the theater. I came back to the theater because I realized that my role at Fortune was that I'm a, that I'm a grassroots person. Uh, I mean, that's my, uh, my, I think, where I excel. Mm -hmm. uh, and Fortune had reached the point where it was bursting, and it had to go in new directions, and I didn't think I was the person for it. And we were blessed finding a woman named Joanne Page who had a vision and a tenacity, and the end result, she created the castle, which is... Which is what I wanted you, and I'd love to end with the castle, which, you know, is obviously both a, a play and an academy, so and, if you and can a tell, passion of mine. yes, and if you could tell people J about it. J uh, one of the things that we always knew at Fortune Society is that people coming out of prison need some place to land that's safe. So many people come out and they're homeless, and the shelter system in New York is a halfway house, halfway going back, drug filled. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a disgusting con. The whole I don't, the city has to really deal with the the shelter system. Um, and so the castle was created, the Fortune Academy, 140th and Riverside Drive, and it was to be a residence for men and women, unheard of. Uh, in the financing of it, it was clear that we would not take money from correction or parole so that it would not have, because every halfway house that we've seen has either been correction or parole run and has a custodial atmosphere, that if people are going to change their lives, they're going to have to be in an atmosphere that's supportive. And the other thing is the one basic rule is no violence or the threat of violence. If people want to reclaim their lives, they have to feel they're in a safe environment. And the castle opened in 2002. And Joanne wanted Thursday night community meetings so that the executive team could meet with the residents to see how the house is going, what the culture of the house is. And I went to the first meeting, and I don't think I've missed three or four in the 10 years because it, it um, this, there are residents in the room, I won't embarrass them, but the, the, I don't know how seriously people take it when they arrive. But it really is an opportunity to see people reclaim their lives. It's one of the most exciting things I've ever seen. Could there be anything in more justice. interesting and moving? And I've seen people go from that prison face, the fear, the anxiety, the distrust, to learn. We, well, we call it the. There was a guy named Solio Kirby. Do you remember Solio? Solio, Solio arrived with one of these faces that was, the world had come to an end, and he gradually learned to smile. And at the end, you couldn't stop them from smiling, and we call it the, uh, the solio smile. Mm -hmm. And we watch people in an atmosphere that permits them to um, that think things may be possible. Now, being a theater person, I was sitting listening to these stories, and I'm thinking, Jesus, this is like an audition for a, you know, for a series. And I became very friendly with a guy named Hamza Hakim, who had done unlike most people coming out of prison, he did 15 years, came out, and he came out saying, what's new, what can I do, Wick? You know, he wanted to do everything. He, he was ready. And we went to a lot of plays together, and he and I started talking about how we had to dramatize the lives of the people at the castle. And sadly, Hamza died of a massive heart attack at the age of 43, it broke my heart. But his best friend there was a guy named Casimiro Torres. Mm -hmm. And Kaz uh, came to me months after uh, uh, Hamza passed away. And, and we started talking about that again. And we started thinking about doing a play. And I, I had always loved plays like the Vagina Monologues. You know, what makes that so good is because you don't need sets and you don't need costumes. The power has to be in the word that's being spoken. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's how we'll stage it. We'll, we have to get people who have made a commitment to, to a new life. And so we talked to people in the castle, uh, Kenny Harrigan, Vilma Ortiz Donovan, Angel Ramos, and Kaz, who between them had done 60 years in prison and really were committed to a, a new life. I asked them each to write a one-page biography. Then I interviewed them based on the information they gave me. And so it's their words, but I dramatically, because I'm a theater person, and I dramatically shaped it, childhood, alienation, arrests, prison, drugs and alcohol, castle. 
change. Reclamation, yeah. Reclamation. And so uh, we, uh, we were going to do it at the castle. For, I announced it on BAI, and we do, were going to do it three or four performances to raise some money. And one of the people that came was Eric Krebs, who said, I want to move this off Broadway. And we, we went to the New World Stages. We ran on weekends for a year. Interesting thing, though, the press would never interview the cast. None of them were ever interviewed. And as a former press agent, I thought this was one of the most dramatic stories I've ever worked on. I've worked on 200 shows, the most interesting cast. cast we're playing at the New World Stages, which used to be the Dollar Movie, movie Theater. Do you remember on 50th? Kaz used to sleep there as a homeless teenager in the theater where he was playing. God, that's a story. Of course it is. Frank Sheck of the Post told me the Post wouldn't run his rave review. The, the Times gave a favorable review, and but buried it. Mm. Nobody would talk to them. ABC, a guy from ABC came and interviewed the cast and called me a week later and said they won't play it. I because they're not I, stars? No, 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 no. I think it is, I think that the media has such an investment in selling crime and fear that hope is not the it's story. It's not sexy that, for them. You know, at one point, somebody wanted to do a TV series based on me and, and other guys. This is 25 years ago. And uh, NBC paid $10,000 to Fortune, and Peter Parnell wrote a pilot. They had bought it. And they came to me, and they said, this will never play. Why? No, no one will sponsor a, a, a play like this, a show mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. So if you watch TV tonight, there'll be 40 shows, cable and lockup, jail, CSI, Right. Lord, the Drugs. sun has never set on law and order. The crimes are always very dramatic. Most of the people coming to Fortune don't have crimes that are dramatic enough to make it on yeah, those programs. Yeah. The, mo the overwhelming number of people have drug histories, and the, and, the, and the main victim has been their own lives. Well, let me ask you this, David, because I know that we have to wrap it up. Why? We do. <laughs> of course, the Knicks are playing tonight, and I want to see the second half. You are one of the heroes of New York. I, I think everyone in this room would agree. Um, can you tell us just briefly some of your heroes? People that I really admired in my life, well, Mrs. Roosevelt, who I had lunch with once, mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, um, I think Adlai Stevenson. I think the people that I really admired most were people of peace. Uh, Mrs. Ro my favorite story of Mrs. Roosevelt was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the first lady of the land. She uh, was at a conference, I think, when Washington was still a segregated city, so she sat in the black section. And the law uh, enforcement people came over and said, Mrs. Roosevelt, you have to move or we'd have to arrest you. So she took her seat and she sat in the center of the aisle. She wouldn't. And she said, I'm with both sides. Perfect. Yeah, I, that's, why I, I, that's why I loved her so much. She, and she had courage. Yeah. You really owe it to yourself to read this book. It, it, it really is a memoir of Broadway glamour, social justice, and political passion. But what I loved about it, besides the fact that we love you so much, David, it, you know, there's so much in the world that just isn't really very real. It's not very substantial. I think everyone in the world wants to live a life well lived. I think we all want to be able to say, I lived a life well lived. This is a man who did it and is continuing to do it. So thank you, David Rothenberg. Do you want to just sign or do you, is there do you any? Do you want to sign? She's saying. And sign? questions. Right. <laughs> oh yeah, questions from the audience. I, I do. Actually, I oh, please. Yes, yes, I will. Here, let me give you this. Good evening, everybody. My name's Easy. I'm, I'm, I'm one of, no, no, no. He doesn't I, need to listen to you. Gotta, I, I, believe me, he doesn't I'm need like bust around, I don't need to pay with my mom. I'm one of the residents that have to pay. I'm back at the castle. I work at WBI with him and phone in the back. And uh, one Saturday, I wanted to see a flight. So I had to come to this place again. I never left the station. So in any event, I wanted to sign up for a Thursday night. He said, no, come to the castle. 
and I did, and that was August 22nd of this year, and I'm, I'm back again. So. I officially call him Daddy because he is. So I thank you. I thank you. He always makes me cry. Uh, it's a beautiful song. Yes. yes. I don't have a question, but I do want to tell you that I donated to your city council. You were the one. <laughs> My twenties, and I just was really. Inspired. It was an exciting campaign. You know, I still run into people. Chris Quinn, Deborah Glick, Tom Dwayne. They all said it was one of the first campaigns they got involved in. We had a terrific campaign, um, and we won Chelsea in the village. We didn't win the east side, and then the district was gerrymandered. If I had run today, would have won because mm -hmm. the east side isn't part of it. But you know what, Bill Kunza, who was a neighbor and a friend, said to me, "God damn you! I have to register because of you." I have to run these things. And he said, "They'll kill you if you get in there." He said, "You're a heel nipper. You know, if you get in, you're going to have to compromise." And I said, I'm a heel nipper. He said, yeah, you're on the outside making them accountable. He said, that's what you do. Don't go inside. Don't, don't, go, don't go in with them. They'll make you compromise. And I, I, that's why after, I ran a very good race. And I, I, after, it's a 16-year incumbent and got about 45%. And everyone said, if you run again, it's yours. And I said, no, I don't want it. I, I'd rather nip out the heels. Mm -hmm. But I, w I was glad that I ran because I got AIDS on the... On the, I got AIDS on the agenda, and I got Fortune Society on the agenda. The stories in this book are so illuminating and so, I mean, when you were talking about heroes, I was, I, I, re I read the book a couple of times, actually, and, and <laughs> Mel and Kenny and Fran and Joanne, I mean, all these people that you will meet when you read this book. They are heroes. They are unbelievable people. I mean, I actually, now they're part of my consciousness. And it's, it's a very, very, it's an important book, but these are, these are lives that we really need to know about. And you really illuminated them for us. And I think that's very, very important. Thank you. Really, it really is true. Yeah. <laughs> he has a question. As a historian, could you, uh, these are sort of big questions, but hopefully not to respond. Could you mention, talk about one way that Broadway has changed since you first kind of deeply engaged with it? And one way that prison uh, Well, Broadway is I don't know if you're talking about what's on stage or what's or the Broadway community. When I was worked on Broadway, when I first came, there were none of those high rises, and you'd walk around Broadway and you knew everybody because everybody was working in the theater around there and all the, you'd go into the, uh, to all the restaurants, you know, they weren't restaurants, they were the joints that you- The hangouts. The hangouts, the theater bar and Downey's and uh, the- Sam's. The Edison Hotel and everybody knew each other and there was a great sense of community about the theater and there was always these t uh, bigger than life producers like Alex Cohn and David Merrick and Kermit Bloomgarden. Now a show gets on there's 33 producers, you know, this one's white, this woman's husband left a four million dollars, this one made a lot of money as a car dealer, they don't know anything about theater. You know, I, I remember working on a show and the vote was 20 to 7 about a, a release going out about the commas. Um, so th th and that's what it's changed. The other thing that's changed, obviously, is, is that the theater has priced itself out. Theater used to be for New Yorkers, now it's for, for tourists who are on a, on a, a bank account. Uh, most people I know can't afford going to the theater, so things like BAI or TDF or the, or the window makes it possible. But theater itself is, is, uh, has become an elitist proposition. And the prison system? The prison system is still an exercise of futility. The answer to the prison system is fewer people being locked up so that the, those that are locked up can have, be in an environment that deals with the fact that can, the, the amazing thing that the public doesn't ever deal with is people go to prison for having done something against the law and they're never confronted with it inside in an environment that doesn't allow you to be honest about yourself. Mm -hmm. So that nobody, the, and then you learn how to survive in this violent subculture, this uh, strange subculture, and then you have to come out <coughs> to a world that doesn't want you and try to adjust. 
Larry White at the, at the castle said, to survive in prison, you put on coats of armor, one after the other. And then after you have four or five, they come to you one day and say, you now come out. But nobody tells you how to take off those coats of prison survival and how to function out here. And so that it's a daily process. You know, at the Thursday night meeting, one of the, it seems like the simplest thing, we talk about it all the time. What are you gonna do if somebody pushes you on the subway? And pr it guarantees, got, you, got, you have an answer? <laughs> I would like to thank you. I'm one of the people here. Show me how to adjust back to society, how to let my life on the building function, how to take those coats off the wall, you know, introducing me to new, new dick on the wall. You're going to the theater now, Tony. Yeah. Isn't that nice? He introduced me to the theater. Mm -hmm. And it's just a new world. It just blows my mind, bro. To see these people, to see these individuals on the stage, to hold these lines, and to remember these lines, to really be in depth character they playing. Just, and it's just amazing and my son just won't let me stop taking them to the blue man. <laughs> <laughs> That's abusive. And I, you know, and I just want to thank Dave because I'm reading the book now. You know, for starting Fortune Society and all the individuals that have something to do with helping me get my life on track. You know, and it's just a it's just a remarkable thing. I'm just loving life today. Mm. And watching you change has been one of the. <laughs> Who did I did? Oh well. That, Thank you, Jessica. Well, I'm not going to tell the story, but it was one of the most. It's, well, we all cried that night because it was one of the most dramatic things. Because Tony, we won't go into the specific specifics, but Tony started dealing with something that it was deeply buried in him. And we all were in tears because, but you, you were in a room that permitted you finally to, to talk about it. And that what was so, and you were gonna leave the room and Stanley said, you gotta stay for this. Yeah, it allowed me to be me. I didn't have to, how can I say, cover up, be ashamed of what I had inside me and shit. That was exciting. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. On that note, before we all cry. <laughs> no, Thank it, you. Uh, Tony, that was, that was, that, that uh, talk about drama. That was a night that, that we'll be talking about a long time. Thank you all for being here.